So we did have a couple of hiccups when we were recording this program. So I've tried my best to stitch the pieces together, but it's going to be a little iffy at the beginning. So apologies for that. She was young enough. She grew up around people. She imprinted on humans. She thinks she's one of us. She treats me as her mate. So she's worked as a good education bird. She's now retired and 23 years old, but she kind of started everything. In 2015, we opened the International Owl Center in a storefront in Houston. So it's a big old historic brick building, which is a good way to get started, but it's not an ideal facility. Very foofy. These again are very good for insulating. Um, and then we get into uh -huh, some fancy feathers. Let's see if we can do this. Feathers. Um, in owls, can I get this? Can you see, let's go out and back in. See all these feathers right along the bill? These are called rictal bristles, not rectal bristles, rictal bristles. And they're very stiff and they're very tactile. So owls are farsighted. They don't see well up close. So usually if they're doing something up close, they're closing their eyes and literally just feeling with these bristles around their bill. It's kind of like a mouse and having whiskers. Um, so those specially ad adapted feathers are called rictal bristles. And they have bristles elsewhere, but on owls, it's very noticeable right around their, their bills. Um, phyloplumes. These are fun. They're just a long shaft with just a little tiny tuft on the tip. And I'm going to see if I can show you one. They're very hard to see. And this tail, oh my gosh, this might work. Cool. Do you see? I'm gonna get it on the right side. Oh, where did it go? Where did it go? That one feather that's just sticking up by itself. Whoa. Not so much now. There we go. Do you see that one feather with a tuft right up against that board? That's a phyloplume. So it's literally like just a hair with a little tuft on the tip of the tip of it. And phyloplumes help the bird sense where their feathers are on their body. It's kind of the position, helps them sense the position of their feathers. So they have these little tiny phyloplumes located throughout their body to help them feel where their other feathers are. Um, contour feathers are what we know best. Those are the body feathers. Those are what give owls their shape. Um, and we know, Let's go big here. Flight feathers. So these are the wing feathers, and there's a fancy name for wing feathers. They are called remages. So the single singular is remage, plural is remages, and that's all the primaries and the secondaries. So it's all the flight feathers. Um, there's also coverts. So those are the feathers that cover the base of the primaries and the secondaries these feathers up here, which, sorry, our wings are not in beautiful shape because they've been handled by thousands of people over the last few years, but gives you the basic idea that this, uh, this is a covert that covers the base of the primaries and the secondaries. Now, the difference between primaries and secondaries is if my arm is an owl wing, and it's basically the same, the primaries all attach to the hand. They all insert on the hand bones. The secondaries all insert on the ulna along here. That's where their flight feathers are. And then they do have a little thumb bone, and there's three or four feathers that attach up here, and those are called the alula feathers, which I can't really show you on a dried specimen because you have to be able to flip them up separately, but those help um, when they're steering in the air. They can um, move those alula feathers to help them um, guide where they're going. So you've got alula feathers, primary feathers, and secondary feathers. And you can kind of see the difference. Owls always have 10 primaries. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
And then when you get to the secondaries, they're a slightly different shape and a different angle. And they have different numbers of secondaries based on the species, but they all have 10 primary feathers. Some of these are in pretty sad shape from being picked up a lot. So that's primaries and secondaries. Then we have tail feathers. So this is a great gray owl tail. That was a great gray owl wing. Um, and great gray owl tail feathers are very big. They also have a fancy name. So these are called rectrices. Plural is rectrix with an X on the end. Um, but um, singular is rectrix. Plural is rectrices. So that's the fancy name for the tail feathers. And I don't have a great example of this, but you all know owls have, some owls have these feathers up here. We call them ear tufts. They're not really the ears. They just look like ears and there's a fancy word for those. So this can be your word for the day to try and incorporate into conversation today. These are called plumicorns. So kind of like unicorns, but they're plumicorns. Um, now let's get our great gray owl head back. I'm using great gray owls because they're big, so it's easier to show things. Now, when you get into, excuse his specimen tag, all of our specimens, I don't know if you can see this, they all have, that's upside down, labels that say who found it, where they found it, information about them, how they died. We didn't kill any of these specimens to use them for the owl center. Um, they've all been found dead for different reasons. So our great gray owl buddy here, these are the facial disc feathers. And if I can get some of these pulled out just a little bit, you're gonna see that those feathers are just very open construction. Let's see if I can get it to focus. Uh, the sound literally goes through those feathers. Let's try this again. Uh, they're, they're not solid. They don't have a solid vein like other ones do. They have all the, the barbs that stick out like this, but that's it. They're just very open construction and they're literally letting the sound come through those feathers and hit these auricular feathers. These are the ones that make up the facial disc of the owl. And owls vary a lot. They don't all have um, well-developed facial discs at all. Some don't really even have facial discs. But those that use hearing for hunting do. So like I talk with my hand, even though you can't see my face. Um, these auricular feathers here are really densely packed on an owl that use, uses hearing for hunting. And the sound goes through these feathers bounces off these and into the ear, the ear opening. I'm not sure if I can even show you in here. There's a nice, um, you're still seeing some auricular feathers there. Anyway, trust me, the ear is way deep down in there somewhere. But that's how the facial disc of an owl works. Okay, I'll put this one down here. Every now and then people ask us, how many feathers does an owl have? Ha ha ha. <clears throat> Would you like to count? Somebody actually did count um, on a female great horned owl that was found dead. Can we have people guess? Oh, yeah. Um, if you type in chat, type your guess. How many feathers you think a great horned owl has on its entire body? Oh, 12,000 is very close. 2,222 is way low. 1,300 is low. I think Ducky has a fairly educated guess. Ooh, Terry is also close. 13,500. 12,500 is quite a good guess also. There's a lot, basically. So the one that was counted, and granted it may vary based on molt, because obviously they're losing feathers every year, right? Um, the one that was counted had 12,259 feathers. That's a lot. Um, and I found a place where somebody had counted a barred owl, and that's a slightly smaller owl, and it had fewer feathers. The barred owl was 9,206 feathers. So basically, they've got a lot of feathers and most of those get molted every year. 
Um, the body feathers aren't quite such a big deal to molt, but if you're flying for a living, molting your flight feathers is a big deal. Now apparently tails are not so important because owls molt um, pretty much all of their tail feathers every year. Owls have 12 tail feathers, so two in the middle, um, those are called the deck feathers, and then they work out from there, and they're kind of mirror images of each other. But they generally molt those all every year, and some owls, some individuals, and it may vary by year or by individual, they'll molt all of them at once. So they literally have no tail at all, and they're still able to fly around and do their stuff. Now the wing feathers, that varies by species. The smaller ones may be able to molt all of their wing feathers in one year, but it varies by species. So if you're a species that depends on hearing for hunting, something like a saw white owl or a boreal owl or a barn owl, they tend to replace their feathers slower, probably because it's more important to keep those quiet adaptations. And when you have gaps in your feathers, that's going to mess with the airflow and, and make you a louder flyer. Um, so it takes a long time for them to molt. If you're a big owl, something like an eagle owl, it may take at least four years to replace all of your flight feathers. So that presents an interesting opportunity. People will always say, can you tell how old an owl is? It's really hard. Um, there's no good way to do it other than looking at their feathers of a species that does not molt all of their wing feathers every year. Now, if you get something like a great horned owl that may take typically four years to molt all of their wing feathers, and all of their wing feathers are of the same generation, you know it's a first year bird that hasn't gone through a molt yet. You know it's a one year old. And uh, many owl species, they've been able to document uh, molt patterns. They have basic patterns in which they molt their feathers. Um, if they're in the first few years, they may be able to say, especially saw and owls, oh, that's a second year bird, or that's a third year bird, or Eh, it's beyond third year. Usually when you get beyond three years old, it's hard to say for sure. So back to our great gray owl wing. Great gray owls take many years to molt and this poor one is pretty beat up, but you'll see some of these feathers are in really bad shape. Look at this one. You know that's an old feather. It's really ratty. It's in terrible shape. It probably hasn't been replaced for several years. Um, and I'm not sure if the lighting is good enough to see. Um, you see this one, white spots are kind of chewed out. The dark part of the feather has melanin in it, so any dark pigment actually makes the feathers stronger. Um, where you don't have it, where you have white spots on the feathers, the feathers are weaker. So on an older feather, you'll see places like this where white spots are missing. That means it's an older feather. Um, and with really proper lighting, which this is probably not great lighting, you can see these feathers are darker, which would mean they're younger. And especially if you look at the tip of this one, it's much lighter and very ratty. So that's probably an older feather. So that means this bird is more than one year old. And if I were an expert at aging great gray owls, I probably could have an idea of how old it is. Um, I'm not. This is a, there's a lot that goes into aging owls. But I can just say that this bird is more than one year old. Um, okay, real quick lessons on what makes owl feathers special. Because you've always heard that owls have silent flight. Why? Let's go back to our great gray owl. The biggest thing is their P10, which is their outer primary. Oops wrong side. Can you see that serration on there? That's just on the leading edge of the wing. So it's usually P10, which is the outer primary, um, sometimes a little bit on P9, but that serration changes the airflow um, to make it quieter as it goes over the wing. Now not all owls have this. Here is um, a uh, hawk owl wing, Ooh, really hard to see, but that outer primary has just a hint of a serration, but nothing like on a great gray owl. These are more diurnal hunters, they're not depending on their hearing as much for hunting, so they don't have that. So not all owls have these adaptations. The second thing that owl wings have 
is the trailing edge of their feathers tends to be, it doesn't zip together like the rest. And again, that changes the airflow and makes it come together in a more quiet way as they're flying through the air. And the third thing I probably can't show you, but great gray owls are the best at having it. Oh, let me try and feather. I have so much stuff lying around here. Can you see? No, oh, that's fuzzy. The top surface of the feather is really, oh, there, it's got a velvety pile. It's really soft and fluffy. And that keeps the feathers quiet as the feathers are sliding across each other. So those are the three things that help keep owl, owls quiet when they fly, but it varies tremendously from species to species. If you are a fish owl in Africa or Asia and you eat fish for a living, you're not depending on your hearing. You don't hear the fish and the fish don't hear you. They don't have well-developed facial discs. They don't have serrations. They have very little of that velvety pile, if at all, on the top surface of their feathers. They're, they're lacking most of the adaptations for silent flight, no serrations at all. So just bear in mind, not, owls are the, not all owls are the same. There was a question earlier about the term for that pile on top. Is there a, a special term? Yes. Um, and the best place to find this stuff is in this book. This is the most awesome book about owl feathers on the planet. Not kidding. So it's The Feathers of European Owls by Marian Cieslak. So he was from Poland. He died before this was translated into English. It's, the original is in Polish, um, but you can get it in English. Usually you have to order it from the UK. And so he talks about that in here, and it's called the Penu... Penula is plural, penulum is singular, so that the penulum is on one individual barbule. Penula, P-E-N-N-U-L-A, is the fuzz over the whole surface of the, of the feathers. But this, this is a book, you have to order it from Europe. I think there's some places in the UK that carry it, but, uh, or in, in the Netherlands, but I think mostly from Europe. But this it's a 200 page book only about owl feathers. And they do compare to owls elsewhere in the world too. Amazing, amazing book. Probably have to read it about four times to comprehend, comprehend it all. Um, I think I need to wrap up what I'm doing. I think I might have to do like feathers part two and wings because I could talk for, there goes a down feather. I could talk forever about feathers, but as somebody pointed out, yes, you'd like to see a live owl. Um, so let me take just a couple more questions in chat. If somebody wants to do a couple questions and then I'm going to bug out and let Joe and others handle things and I will come back with a live owl. So if you have questions, go ahead and, and raise your hand in chat. Um, you can try and raise your hand in real life if you can't figure out how to raise your hand in chat. Um, I, I am looking at the gallery view, so. If anybody has. I have a question from Margie. Where is, what is Carla's background? My background is a wooden wall. <laughs> no, actually I have a degree in, <laughs> I have a degree in biology from uh, Luther College in Iowa. Um, I was a falconer for a while, and then it's just been learning as I go, um, both doing in my own research and going to owl conferences and learning from experts from all over the world. Plus, we present the World Owl Hall of Fame Awards at our owl festival every year in March, and so we get the world's top owl experts coming to Houston and so talking to them. So basically, when I have questions, I can go to the expert on every topic and ask them. So that's been really the best way to learn. But also just questioning things because there are very few books out there where everything is accurate. Like almost no owl books are completely accurate. When you start questioning things and say, you know what, this one said that male great horned owls have wider skulls than females. I don't know if I believe that. So I've got a bunch of specimens in the freezer. So as we dissect them, then we measure the skull width. And what I've found so far is the males are about the same size as the females. So it's also being skeptical and questioning things. 
Are there any other questions? I think everybody wants to see a live bird. I think so. <laughs> okay, I will turn it over to Joe while I pop out and get a live bird. So I'll stop my video for just a moment. Unless you want to look at my background. <laughs> Woo! Okay, I see Sarji asked, will we consider doing more on general owl anatomy at a, another time? We do have two other chats scheduled. Um, next week, a week from today, Thursday, we're going to be doing a program about owl skeletons and skulls and all kinds of bones. Um, the week after that, I don't remember, do you, um, do Marianne, Maxine, do you guys remember what the next one is going to be? Oh. Sorry, cat. Feet, yes. Uh, the one two weeks from now is going to be about feet. Uh, question from Laura. How do owl feathers change as the owl ages or goes through many molts? Um, we don't see a ton of changes with most owls. Um, just because they, they want to blend in. Um, a lot of birds do uh, a seasonal molt. Owls don't do that because they don't need to they don't need to look nice when they're when they're like in breeding plumage like a lot of ducks and songbirds and things do um, in terms of as they as they get older there are some species that look different as young ones than as adults um, an example would be uh, saw wet owls for a couple weeks their baby plumage is just incredibly incredibly vivid they've got this this chocolate brown head and a pumpkin orange belly and this white v in, in on their face um nothing else looks like a baby saw wet owl <laughs> but that only lasts for a couple weeks and then their adult feathers grow in and they look just like an adult um might be able to work with an owl center when you grow up because you're going to be a zoologist awesome that's the way to go how long does it take for a full for new feather to be full size? That depends on how big the feather is going to be. Um, an owl like a sawwet, like our little screech owl Jr., he molts pretty much all of his feathers every year. So if we're talking about one of his flight feathers, which is literally like this long, um, that only takes maybe a month to grow in. But if we're talking about uhu, our Eurasian eagle owl, um, Marianne, could you hold up your your uhu feather. <laughs> These are massive, so they take several months to, to come in. Um, and if you think about it, they're just, they have more material to go through, so it does take quite a long time. Um, any idea why a juvenile will be plumed so vividly seems like a bad idea? It does seem like a bad idea, and honestly, we don't really know why, they, why, the, why the juvenile saw what's look like that. So, who knows? There's a lot that we don't know about owls. Let's see. You have one of those feathers too? Cool. Um, yeah, so if you join the Owl Center as one of our higher level members, you do get a, a card with a feather from our Eurasian Eagle Owl because she is not native to North America, so it is legal to have feathers from her. Um, if you want to join our, um, our Owl Center as a member, I'm going to share my screen so you can see what you do, um, how to do that. So, this is our website. We have our little pop-up coming up that says if you want to sign up for our email list you can sign up here uh, we have our regular newsletter and we have our um, owl research newsletter you can join either of those or both if you want um, over here on the side we've got all kinds of things about our programs next down future plans we do plan on building a, a permanent facility in the future you can see all about our research and we do have a live cam on some of our owls, Rusty and Iris. Um, this is, I'm not gonna open it right now because I don't wanna make things too laggy, but um, you can join this and you can talk to Maxine and Marianne and Ducky and all kinds of people 
um, in the chat on our live cam. We've got DIY activities. You can find out what kind of owl you would be. You can build an owl nest box. You can do some coloring pages. You can do some puzzles. Lots of fun if you're stuck inside. You can't go out and do anything. You can learn about owls that way. If you find a baby owl on the ground, this is owlet time. Oh, looks like Carla's back with JR. All right, let's, uh, let's head back to JR. Just this little bit because I'm standing instead of sitting. So <laughs> JR likes to look at things. So he is an eastern screech owl. Um, he would be the smallest one we have in the eastern United States that has ear tufts. They come in both red and gray, and he's very clearly a red one. Now there's some in Europe also, like tawny owls have red and gray morphs. Um, he doesn't change color, he's just red all the time. And if you look close, he's got pale yellow eyes. He's busy looking out one of the windows right now. There we go, can you look at everybody? So can you see his rictal bristles right around his bill here? Can I get him really close? <laughs> he's like, what are we doing? So he's got rictal bristles right around here. Um, his facial disc feathers let the sound through, but then the actual um, auricular feathers, the disc is right here. Now as a screech owl, he does not have asymmetrical ears. You've probably heard about a lot of owls having asymmetrical ears. Um, many do not have asymmetrical ears. So screech owls are not noted for exceptional hearing. His ears are a lot smaller than many owls are. Um, so they hunt a little bit more at dawn and dusk. These can be found um, in urban areas, so in cities, in towns, out in the country. Yeah, he's like, man, I have to wear my jesses. He normally doesn't have to wear um, the straps on his legs. As owls, they have feathers on their, on their tarsi, on, the, on their legs. It looks like their shin, but it's actually an elongated foot. Um, and when you have jesses on them, his, for some reason, even if he's not tethered or restrained, just their rubbing on his legs damages his feathers. <clears throat> so we've stopped having him wear them all the time. So he doesn't like to wear them when he has to, but he only has to wear them for short periods when he's doing programs. When he's in his aviary at home, he doesn't have to wear them. But that's why he was picking at those. And if you see, he's got a little yellow band on his leg. That's his little bling that he wears. But it shows that he was hatched in captivity. Um, a wild born owl would not have to wear one of those. His parents were permanently injured birds from the wild. They both have eye injuries and they were working as education birds at the Illinois Raptor Center. They thought they both were girls, um, <laughs> so they were housed together. And uh, one day there were eggs and females lay infertile eggs in captivity, so they didn't think anything of it until they hatched. And then they realized one had to have been a boy. So JR was one of their offspring. And it's a, it's a very separate process to breed them in captivity and to release. And most permitting authorities won't allow release. But because he was hatched in captivity and raised around people, he was a very good candidate as an education bird because he's totally comfortable around people. And he actually, even though he was raised with his siblings, he was raised with a lot of human contacts. So he actually thinks he's a person. So if my hair is messed up, that's his fault because it's breeding season and he's a boy and he thinks, did you hear him? That's his trill that he does. He thinks um, I'm his mate. So whenever I go into his aviary, he lands on my head and copulates like I'm a female. That's nice. So that's one of his two primary calls that he does. And that's the only one that he does right now is this trill. Um, he also does more in the fall, a whinny, kind of a You do more of the, yeah, he says, I want to be loose and fly around and do whatever. Eastern screech owls are cavity nesters, so you can put up nest boxes for them, and they do nest in people's yards um, as long as you have trees. These guys eat almost anything um, that's small enough, so that includes worms, bugs, um, small lizards and snakes, small mammals, small birds. They eat all kinds of everything. 
Um, so they can adapt to huge amount of different um, locations and, and climates. And so they're found throughout the whole entire eastern United States. Not surprisingly, there's a western screech owl also um, that does pretty much the same thing just out west. And they don't have a red version. They just have the, the gray form of the western screech owl. And they have a dark bill. Otherwise, they look really similar. But you see his is really pale. Can you show him your bill? is very pale bill, whereas a western screech owl has a very dark bill. That's one of the ways you can tell a gray eastern screech from a western screech owl. Are you looking at everybody? Or is he looking out the window? They have very large eyes for the size of their head. Brains, owls are not known really for having big brains. So literally if you dissect one, the eyeballs in a great horned owl, the brain of a great horned owl is actually a little bit smaller than one eyeball. So they don't have really big brains, but they're very good at what they do. So you can see his wing feathers over here, and he has a teeny weeny tail. His tail feathers, Eastern screech owl tails, are very, very short. Yeah. And they have ear tufts, but you notice his aren't sticking up. So Owls that have ear tufts do not always hold them straight up. So he can lay them down. He does that when he's relaxed. If he was alert, these would be sticking straight up and his head feathers would be compressed and his whole body plumage would be compressed and he would do his um, concealment posture, which he's trying to look like a stick. So he gets tall and skinny. Usually he turns his wing towards whatever is scaring him. It's like, just let me go already. What do you think? There are a few questions in the chat. Okay. Um, we have a question from Margie. What is the process to obtain an education bird, i.e. how does one facility get a bird over a different facility? Um, oh, you mean as far as placement? I'm going to sit down here. Um, you have to, to get a bird, you have to demonstrate that you know what you're doing with the bird, you have experience with the bird. Um, I think currently, what they say is you have to have 200 and some hours of experience working with a bird of prey um, at another facility, and if you're going to do programs, at least 10 hours or something doing educational programs under somebody else. And then as far as who gets which bird, um, it's a few people are involved in making that decision. So to get JR, we have to apply to the state and the federal permitting authorities to say, okay, the Illinois Raptor Center has this one. We would like to get it. They're willing to give it to us. So first, the Illinois Raptor Center had to say, we're willing to give it to you. Second, we had to apply to the state and federal permitting authorities, and they had to agree that we could get the bird. Um, so the state or fed could say, nope, we're not going to let you get it. And normally that would be you don't have experience with the bird or proper facilities or something like that. Um, but the first step is finding a facility that's willing to transfer a bird to you. Duffy asks, can we get them a permit to keep an owl? Um, you know, only education facilities can get permits to keep owls. So they cannot be kept as pets in the United States. Now this varies by country. Some countries do allow owls as pets. So the whole Harry Potter thing and having owls as pets was not really good for owls in many countries. So the UK does allow many owls to be kept as pets. So you could just go out and say, hey, I want to buy a snowy owl from a breeder. And you could do that. You didn't have to demonstrate that you had proper housing or experience or anything. And then people got owls and realized, oh, this is not what I thought it was going to be. And it, it, it wasn't good because most people don't know how to take care of them. They're really high maintenance animals. It's not like a reptile or something. These guys, he actually could use a bill trim right now, but that's a multi-person thing. And with COVID, that, that's, yeah, you don't like your bill trimmed either. Um, I mean, you got to look at Bill's talons. For us, the closest um, veterinary care is two and a half hours away. So you have to know the basics of that yourself. Um, plus, they make a lot of noise at night. Um, and they don't like it so much when you go away. Human imprints, especially. You know, you see people being cuddly with owls on YouTube. And he will actually tolerate stuff like that because he thinks I'm his mate. And that's a normal thing for Thanks for the poop on the glove there. 
So poop is another reason that uh, owls are not great pets. You can't potty train them. They poop wherever. So there's a whole, we actually have on our website, a top 10 reasons why owls don't make good pets. So even if it's legal, it's not really a good idea, but they can be used for education in the United States by educators who have demonstrated um, that they have proficiency in doing that. How's that for a long answer? <laughs> We have a question from James. How often do we coat their beaks and trim their talons? Uh, when needed. So we try to do it as infrequently as possible because it's not fun for the birds and it's not fun for us. Usually it involves grabbing and holding them, holding their mouth open and taking a dremel and um, filing the beak down that way. Um, talons are a little easier because they can stand there and you can take a dog toenail clipper and and clip the tips, which they don't like very much either. So it varies. Um, with Alice, I've been able to go, you know, a few years without doing it, but it seems like the more you do it, the more you have to keep doing it. It's like it stimulates it to grow more, but they're just like fingernails or toenails. Bills and talons are continuously growing all the time. And in the wild, they're going to get more wear and tear. They're going to be eating more, more exposed to the weather. So um, we tend to do it once or twice a year, maybe, something like that. Varies from bird to bird. Someone wants to know where are his ears? His real ears are hiding right underneath there. So they're directly across each other on the side of the face, right at the edge of the facial disc. He's got holes in the sides of his head under his feathers. We have a question from Mary Ann who asks, how many eggs did JR's parents lay and did they all hatch as healthy owlets? Um, it has varied over the years because they've laid eggs several years now. His batch, um, I'm trying to remember, they, they actually ate their first babies because they just assumed they were infertile eggs, so they, they didn't do anything with them. And when they saw they hatched, he went back to get his camera, came back, and they had eaten the heads off their babies. Um, <clears throat> so captive birds don't always do well raising babies, so now he pulls them and puts them in an incubator. So they laid a clutch of four, and all of those hatched in JR's batch. Um, and the next year, I don't think they all hatched. I think there were some that didn't. But some species have better hatching success than, than other species. And when you're doing it in an incubator, it's never quite as good as underneath mom. But then you don't eat them, if, even if mom might accidentally sometimes. Other questions? Mm -hmm. I don't see any other owl-related questions. Um, Melanie says, I want to show this session to my grandson who will see, he will, they will see tomorrow. Will it be posted later? Yes, we will try to post this later. We have to figure out, um, I think it's being recorded to the cloud and then we can post it somewhere. There have been a couple hiccups with recording, so we'll, hey. maybe a little piecemeal, but we'll try to, we'll, we'll try to stitch it together and get it up. Okay, we'll do what we can. So JR would like to remind everybody that his species and a lot of other species nest in tree cavities. That means we all know that live trees are important for owls. Dead and dying trees are very important for owls for nesting spaces. So screech owls are one that absolutely use nest cavities in dead and dying trees. So if you have a dead or dying tree on your property and it's safe to leave it there, it's really important to leave it up for owls and for other species. In certain countries like Germany and Austria, they pay people to leave dead trees standing. That's how important they are. So if it's safe, please leave them up. Now, if they have to come down or you have to severely prune them because they're gonna land on a building or something, it's best to wait and not do it this time of year because this is the time of year when these guys have babies in the nest. And I already got a call this year from somebody who had cut down a tree and there were baby screech owls in the nest. So if you can wait till late summer or fall to do any tree cutting, pruning, removal, things like that, that's very helpful for, well, JR is looking at something, very helpful for screech owls and other cavity nesting owls. So just remember those dead and dying trees are habitat trees for owls. 
I didn't get completely through my my website tour. Oh, um, okay. Where JR came back, so I don't know if um, we are almost at eleven o'clock. Okay. Um, so I don't know if you want to wrap it up with JR, and I can um, finish that tour or what. We 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 didn't really uh, test yeah, this part of the program. <laughs> yeah, finish up the tour, and I will put JR back because he will be a happy camper being. A free boy back in his aviary. So he's got an eight foot by ten foot space so he can fly circles in there. He's got two different nest boxes and a couple of bath bowls and a real branch and a security camera so we can watch him in there. And then he gets to have his jesses removed. So thank you very much for coming. I'll let turn it over to Joe. She can finish giving you a tour of our website. Um, if you enjoyed this, please consider supporting the Owl Center. Normally we get a lot of support from our visitors. Um, last year, I think between visitors and programs, we had about 15,000 people come. Obviously, that number is zero right now because of um, where we're at in the world. So if you want to, whoops, help buy these guys dinner. We um, just spent $1,000 yesterday on food for our owls. Um, normally, all of that is paid for by visitors leaving donations for us to, to buy food for the owls. And we do have a section on the website, which Joe maybe touched on already, where you can buy dinner for the owls, buy them their rats and mice. We'll get to that. Okay. Yeah. Or become a member. Or there's all kinds of ways that you can support us so we can keep doing what we're doing. So thank you very much for tuning in. And now let's see if I can stop the video with <laughs> JR sitting on my finger. Bye. All right, so the last link I put in chat goes to our, um, let's see, goes to our link on how to live an owl-friendly life. So we talked a little bit about keeping dead trees up. Um, we've got all kinds of things that you can do to keep your, to keep owls safe. Um, if you want to check those out, I did post that link in the chat. Um, that is under owls and you on our website. Um, it also talks about owls as pets, owl myths, and FAQ. Underneath that we have visit us. You can learn about the Owl Center. Um, you can learn about our birds. You can learn about us people if you're interested in that history of the Owl Center. If you want to support us, um, that is right here in the in the sidebar. You can become a member um, members are very helpful for us. If you become a member, um, you get free admission to the Owl Center for a year. Um, obviously, we, we can't do that right now, but once we open again, um, you get free admission to our Owl Festival in March. That is a blast. It's a huge three-day three, three day, um, event where we talk all, all kinds of owl stuff. Um, you get 10% off in our gift shop, including the online store, which I'll go over. Um, various level memberships have different perks, and you can see that in our, our little uh, graph here. Um, you can join through our store. You can join by mail or PayPal um, right from the website. If you don't want to become a member, but you just want to help us out, you can go to our donate page. And you can buy dinner for the owls. There is uh, a donate link right here in the middle. Um, if we go to buy dinner for the owls, it takes you to our donations page. So you can buy dinner for the owls uh, one night or more, one week or more, for one month or more, or however much you want to help us out. That does bring us to the store. Uh, you can buy all kinds of owl merch on our website. Um, we've got shirts, we've got postcards and books, and we used to have coffee, but I think we're almost out. <laughs> um, jewelry and owl pellet dissection kits and toys and all kinds of things. So um, if you want to become a member, you can um, do that here from the website as well, or donations. Um, our website is internationalowlcenter.org. This is our homepage. Um, you can see all of our events coming up here. We've got all kinds of links um, to various other helpful places. Um, I think I was interrupted when, when JR came in. I was talking about what happens if you find a baby owl on the ground, because this is owlet season. We're in, in, North Amer or in uh, the Northern Hemisphere, we're seeing a lot of baby owls this time of year. If you find one, what do you do? Um, 
you can go to our, our website. We do have our um, kind of a walkthrough step-by-step -step thing. Um, if you're in Minnesota or Wisconsin or Iowa or somewhere nearby, you can call us. Um, you can call Carlo or me or um, a lot of us can, can help us out. But if you're not in those areas, you go down to the sidebar here, find a rehabber. And this is a list of all the rehabbers that we can find in various states. So say you're from Montana, you could go to the Montana Raptor Conservation Center or Raptors of the Rockies. Uh, say you're in West Virginia, West Virginia Raptor Rehab Center or the Fish and Wildlife Service. So these are a couple of really helpful um, resources if you find baby owls. So uh, what else? There were a couple other things that I was supposed to help, uh, put in chat. Okay, we have a, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Feather Atlas. This is an amazing resource. If you're interested in, in looking at different kinds of feathers from all kinds of different birds, um, you can go to that. You can see um, different species and different kinds of feathers, and it's, it's very cool. Um, so I put that link in our um, in our chat as well. I think I pretty much covered it all. Thank you, Joe. Okay. okay. So we're going to be trying to do a few of these and see how it goes from here. So this, from what I could tell, seemed to go okay. Um, so next week we have one scheduled and next week's session is going to be on skulls, skeletons, and scleral ossicles. So it's the bones. So scleral ossicles are the eye bones that owls have. And the week after that will be feet. Um, so we'll, if things go well and work well for our schedules, we'll continue to do this. We may try doing them on different days so other people are able to participate. I don't know, we're kind of making it up as we go. Um, so thanks for joining us. Um, if you still have some questions, let us know in chat, um, or you can email us or meet us next week. So thanks for coming and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you to everyone who showed up for our program today. We will be coming back again next week for our program on owl bones. I will be posting in the description of this video all of the links that I posted in the chat. So thank you guys for coming and for enjoying our video. Go ahead and like us and subscribe to our channel. Go ahead and check out Rusty and Iris on our live cam and have a great day. Bye-bye.